All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Stephen Feuerstein. I'm a developer advocate at Oracle Corporation, and with me is Chris Saxon. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Also a developer advocate focusing on database and especially SQL. And we're here for the latest PL SQL Office Hours session in which we're going to talk about exception propagation, and it's going to be Tom versus Stephen. The idea here is that we wanted to take up an issue that actually was raised on the last Office Hours session. And uh, Judith Mansell suggested, why don't we do a whole session on it? Or at least, well, we'll see how much of a whole session we get out of it. And the question is, differences in approaches around propagating exceptions, when you'll handle them, how you pass the exceptions up through the, through the, um, the stack of calls. And I'm positioning this as Tom versus Steven, sort of as clickbait to get people to show up. Not that people have trouble showing up anyway. Um, and the reason it's, it's projected that way is that Tom and I have often been at odds on, on this very topic, and actually on a number of topics. And I just want to say right up front that if you have to pick between what Tom says about Oracle Database and what Steven says about Oracle Database, you know, in general, go with Tom. I'm cool with that. Um, one thing I've also found, though, is that different developers have a different experience of programming. They develop different kinds of applications. They develop applications versus write about developing applications. and you know, I've come to accept after many years on this planet, I'm 60 years old now, that it's really important to never challenge somebody else's subjective experience. For example, you're walking down the road with your wife and your wife says, huh, that guy looks just like George Clooney. You don't say, no, he doesn't. That's ridiculous. You say, oh, he looks like George Clooney to you. How interesting, right? I mean, if I experience it that way, that's my experience. What does that have to do with programming? So I found in a number of topics over the years, Tom and I have disagreed about, for example, TAPIs, uh, table APIs, and this exception propagation topic we're going to talk about here. And I think we both have some good points, but I fundamentally come to realize that for me, it's simply a matter of, I think I've had a different experience of programming from him in a number of ways, and some good, some bad, as we'll, as we'll see. And so I end up with liking things or doing things in a different way because of that, the results of that experience and requirements. So I just want to make it clear we're, we're not here to pick a winner because <laughs> you're going to pick Tom probably, and I, I don't mind losing, but it's more to explore the ideas. And, and really, for me, it's a question. So let's, let's share now. So Tom versus Steven, there's Tom, a mature, handsome fellow, and there's me. I'm, that's me when I was like five. So the question is, where and when do you handle exceptions? So I'm going to basically cover quickly. I'm going to speak for Tom, and any of you on this call can unmute. Speak for Tom yourself as well. For example, if you think I'm misrepresenting Tom, you just dive right in and let us know. Then I'll tell you about my approach and a little bit of why. Then Chris is going to chime in with his thoughts. And then we're going to take a look at code to look at these different uh, alternatives. So Tom, tell us, Tom, what do you say? Tom's basic approach, as I understand it, when it as regarding exception handling, is that you have a stack of calls, A calls B calls C calls D calls E, and right down there at the bottom, an exception is raised. Rather than handle the exception there and then the next one above it and the next one above it and above it, don't do any handling of exceptions in between that lower, lower level block and the outermost block. Let it propagate out unhandled, wrap it at the top, call all those wonderful built-in functions that give you information globally about your application, even from when the error was raised, for example, the backtrace and the error stack. Log those out to your error log and then diagnose and fix your bugs from there. My approach, and it, these are not like either or, and it's not like I always do it one way versus the other. My approach generally though, is to handle the exception local to where it was raised, log information, and then re-raise up the stack. And the primary reason I like to do that, and it's something I wanna to talk to you folks about, maybe I'm missing something, maybe there's a better way to do it, is that to my mind, if you don't handle the exception locally, right where it occurred, you lose at least some of the application state that caused the exception, essentially local variables. Once I'm, once I'm propagated out of that block, I can't see that stuff. The only time I can see it is inside the exception handler, in which case I can log that application info and then propagate up the stack. And then when I need to diagnose it, I've got more information available to me. So that is the, the core issue that I wrestle with as I'm writing my code, as I'm debugging my code, as I'm handling production support, for example, in the dev gym, why would I want to lose that information? And third up, Chris, speaketh. Yeah. Okay, so I think Stephen and Tom both got their own approaches. You know, they're kind of opposite extremes there, but I've got a different way of thinking about this. So we had an office hour session, was it a 
couple of months ago where we talked about APIs and how packages are the APIs for the database. And I think when it comes to handling ex your exceptions, um, that's also a good model for thinking about where you should handle them, how to do it. Because if you think, this is my package, this is the API, anyone can call it, you wanna think, okay, well, who's gonna call this and how will they expect those exceptions to get raised? So what do I mean by that? Well, quite often we kind of say, it's not a good idea to just expose your aura errors to your end users, you know, no one, you know, we've all seen those pictures on Twitter or something where there's like a no date found exception, which is somehow propagated out onto um, a customer screen somewhere. Um, you don't want your application to be like that. You wanna give them friendly error messages and things like, you know, an error has occurred, here's your support ticket number. And part of the API handling should be doing that. It should be logging the error, giving some ticket number and whatever else backend processing. Um, so I'm, I'm saying think in terms of the packages you're building and those APIs, you know, don't kind of go, okay, this pa package is called by that package, that package, let it propagate out as far as it can get. This is, anyone could be the client of this. So do whatever business exception handling you want. Um, and that could be uh, things like generating a ticket number and so on, or um, whatever else it is. Now, of course, you may have packages that you've designed and said, these are specifically backend packages. These are utilities which should never ever be called by the front end application, by the user interface. And you might have different rules around how you handle your exceptions there. But I think conceptually, if you think about handling your um, exceptions at the package boundary, some of the issues around capturing local state um, become easier to manage because you could have package level variables which store information. Now that's not to say you should make all your variables package level variables, but you've got more state available than if you let it propagate outside of the package further up the stack. So that's kind of my position. All okay. right, and you're sticking with it, right? Yeah, my I'm, position, stick I'm it. sticking with it. Okay, so here's what I suggest we do. In general, our plan for this event is to engage in a conversation with you. We're gonna play around in Live SQL. I've set up a script that you can use yourselves and, and we'll step through it. Um, we, I also have, just so you know, I've got my ATP instance up, Autonomous Transaction Processing, so we can also go into SQL Developer and run the same code there. But I really like to use Live SQL so that you have access to it as well. And hopefully you've also gotten your ATP instance set up. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is just search for propagation. So this is exactly what you can do yourselves, exception propagation, innermost, outermost, and in between, or in between. So I wrote this up yesterday to basically walk through the different approaches that I see. And really, literally, as I mentioned before, I'm here to have you explain to me what I'm missing. Because I, I figure Tom's right. Tom's like always right. Okay, so here's the script. Let's just walk through it uh, briefly, quickly. So I've created a little error log table in my autonomous transaction program to write out to the log. I'm sure you have your own variations of that. Hopefully the logger open source utility. Now, I've got innermost, I've got inner that calls innermost, and I've got uppermost that calls inner. And in this first iteration, this looks like Tom's approach. As far as I know, again, let me know if you understand differently. So there are no exception handlers except at the top, <clears throat> at which point I log the error. Notice I've got a problem. I've got a divisor variable and I'm dividing it I'm dividing a number by that divisor, and oh my gosh, it's zero. I wonder what will happen. As you're about to see, I think this is actually a bad choice of an example, but <laughs> I'm sure you'll, you'll accept the, the basic point. So I've created this call, nested set of calls. I run it, and this writes a message out to the log, and here's what we see. So I select from my error log, and it's a minus 1476, which is divisible equal to zero, and then it shows me the error message, it shows me the backtrace back to where it occurred, and that application info that I've passed in, in this case, simply the name. Now, so we've got that information, and as you know, hopefully you all know, this error stack and, and error backtrace and so on, it doesn't matter where you call it. You can call it down at the lower level, you can call it all the way, all the way up at the top, it's gonna give you the same information, that's good. It's not context or block specific in that sense, it's for your session. My approach is more like this. So in my innermost program, I'm gonna trap the exception, I'm gonna log the error, 
I'm going to add my application info being the value of my local variable, and then I'm going to re-raise. Innermost is the inner is the same, uppermost is the same. Now when I run my code again, I see two entries. So the first one right here is the where it was first raised. So the error message is simply the message. There's no stack yet. The backtrace shows me the line in innermost. And notice my application info, it tells me the value of my divisor. It's zero. Now, as I mentioned before, bad example, you didn't need to store the divisor of zero because the error is divisor by zero, division by zero. But I'm sure you get the idea. By trapping the exception, whoops, by trapping the exception here, I have access to that value. And as soon as I leave it, I don't. So I grab it and propagate out. I'll just keep running through these the scripts that I wrote and then we'll we'll get going. And by the way, use the chat if you want to type any messages. Also, uh, you can unmute and talk as well. And in fact, Sven already, I'm with Tom. <laughs> so assuming Oracle propagate exceptions correctly, handle one other's exception at the outermost layer. Provoking thought. Storing local application state is overrated. So Sven, I appreciate that you're with Tom and you handle when others at the outermost layer. So my question to, to Sven and to anybody else is, what about that local application state? It seems like I lose it. And I don't know about you, but in my experience, I really want it. So keep thinking and chatting and so forth, and I'll just keep going through this. So in my third iteration, I've got log errors here. I've got log errors in the intermediate one. I've got log errors all along the way. When others log re-raise over and over and over again, all the way up the stack. And oh, wow. Yeah, great, Steven. Now I've got three entries in my error log for one error. And this is one of the reasons Tom points out, this is a bad idea. And I agree, this is a really bad idea. If I have a stack 15 layers deep, I end up with 15 rows and sorting that out is, is really a drag. So the approach that I take is in my log error procedure, I use one of my negative 20,000 error numbers. I'm gonna use negative 2177. And obviously in a production app, this constant would be out in a package spec somewhere so nobody else is you know, falling over it um, and using it. And then in my code, I say, if the error code is not equal to this special re-raise code, then I insert into my log table, commit because it's an autonomous transaction. And then if I want to re-raise, I use raise application error and I say, hey, I've logged the error, just use my special re-raise code and keep on going from there. So then I do this, I do it here, all this is the same, I've trapped my, got my divisor, and so on and so forth. And now when I run the code again, notice, there's just one entry in my log with my backtrace, my, back, my error stack, my backtrace, my application value. One last iteration, then hopefully we'll dive into some really vigorous conversation. Um, one thing that came up as I was looking through the, the various threads around this topic is that people also have this irritation with writing applications like this in which all your errors go into the log table and then I'm in development, but now I have to open up this select against the table or open up some UI against the table. And I don't want to do that. I just want to see my output. So just a little reminder, with something like conditional compilation, I can say, if I'm in development, don't, don't, don't write to the table, just spit it out onto the screen. And if I'm in, not in development, which should be the, the default, in other words, assume that in development is null when you go into production, nothing, no CC flags are set, then it just falls back on that same code as before and writes it out to the table. And then when I run this version of my, my code, notice now all the output simply comes out to the screen, nothing out, nothing in the table. Is, is there a lot of people who think that, who think that they should see it on the screen as opposed to a table? I've... I don't know. I, I don't know if I can say how many. Um, yeah. it's cert I've certainly, I've seen it, heard it. You know, developers are lazy. They want to see stuff right away. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, it just seems um, useful to have it stored there permanently. So if you clear screen or something accidentally, then oh. you go, oh, yeah, what was that error? <laughs> Absolutely. I I'd have no disagreement there. All righty. So let's, I'm going to stop my share. Chris, any comments on the code you just saw, first of all? So I think uh, one kind of general comment is that there are blocks of code which you expect to have exceptions. So anywhere where you've got a, divide, a divisor, 
division, divide by zero is a possible outcome there. Mm. Um, the other classic example is like single row lookup, no data found and too many rows are both things which are likely to happen. Um, so, and because you kind of expect them, and certainly the case of no data found, that someone's searching for something that doesn't exist, um, I think it absolutely makes sense to handle that there because that is the logic, that's the code that handles it. Um, and the, in fact, the closer the exception handling is to the thing that you expect to throw it, the better, because as you say, you've got all the state. But then there's other exceptions like, I don't know, database files corrupted and you right. know something bonkers has happened. Um, yeah, should we handle those every level? Well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's more debatable. <laughs> That's a really good point. So, in fact, I think a lot of what uh, Tom tends to object to are when others handlers all over the place. And in general, not only in PL SQL, but you even see this more in other languages where you can actually document as part of the code the exceptions you expect to be thrown out of the out of the module. This is an object-oriented language a lot. So the counter argument is don't use when others. You look at your code and you ask yourself what kind of exceptions might occur. I'm doing a select into, so no data found, too many rows. You handle those, but you don't handle when others except at the top. I think that's a pretty good argument. And here's where I fall back on being a pragmatic programmer, I guess, um, which is that sounds good, but when I'm in the, in the grip of programming, writing my code, the idea that I'm going to stop and say, mm, you know, I've got this 75, 200 line procedure, and I'm going to go through it line by line and ask myself, what exceptions could be raised? I mean, I don't do that. I might be able to figure it out, I suppose, but I definitely don't do it. I don't feel like I've got the time now. So again, maybe that's just, that's not a good reason to do something bad. I'm hoping that what I suggest handling locally and re-raising isn't bad, but perhaps it is a reflection of a bit of laziness. Um, we've got some, we've got some we've comments got coming in. Comments. We've got yeah. a lot of comments coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Let's okay. go. Let's see. So Judith Mensel mentions if you only log once at that lower level and then, and then propagate out and you never log along the way, then you lose the full backtrace to the error origin. So this is a really interesting point. So the backtrace traces back to the line in which the error is raised. Uh, let's go back and share. And Chris, so what I'll do is I'll keep the share on and I'll let you yeah. start to run through the chat. Sure, um, okay. So let's go back to one of these other outputs here. Right, so you can see that the backtrace is, is pretty slim right here because there's nothing to trace back to. You're right in there. And then as you go up the stack of calls, your backtrace gets longer and longer. So that's a good point, Judith. Here's the thing. The, 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 key, value, the key data from the backtrace is, line, is the the line at which the error occurred. That's really what you're looking for. Now, it's true that often wanting to know the, the pathway through is also good. Uh, how did you get there? In other words, essentially similar to the call stack or the, and the error stack shows a lot of that as well. So I guess I would say that one of the ways you, we might, I might want to instrument this a little bit more tightly given that point is that on the outermost level, I have a parameter that says, you know, do full recording. So it, it does the snapshot at the lower level, but even at the top level, if I'm, if I'm all the way out, um, I don't ignore it even if it's the re-raise code and I still grab all this information. So that's a good point. I feel like it can easily be finessed or handled in, in the context of this, my approach. What's next, Chris? Okay, so next thing we've got, uh, Tadeo, I would log the error as soon as it happens and not do have any further processing in intermediate layers. So more in line with Steven's approach there, you know, we capture everything and then um, I guess use something like you've got to, Stop logging it all through. Uh, we've got a comment from Pete K. I simply wrote an Apex app to make the logger tables quick and easy to check. Yay! <laughs> okay. I think that's a great way of doing it, yep. definitely. Yes, that's a great thing. And um, certainly having your error logging tables easy to see um, is very useful. It's also worth looking at, um, certainly in production, what extra monitoring you, you have. So maybe kicking out automatic alerts on those not just logging at a table and waiting for someone to find it. So you have mm -hmm. proactive monitoring. So instead of your users saying, oh, by the way, we've got 100 errors today, you go, oh, we've got 100 errors today, and hopefully can pick it up more easily. Mm -hmm. OK, so Sven again. Um, I agree that sometimes we want to store local application state, but also B, 
The need to write local exception handles exists only because of the limitations of the PL SQL language. It is, not, it is currently not possible to add some data to a future exception. Some frameworks like Logger allow it, but it is not so easy to span multiple modules with that. Um, so that's an interesting point. Um, so I guess, Fen, you're saying, hmm, but you would still need some exception handling at each layer to say, I want to source store some state, state there, I assume. I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure that completely gets around the issue. I think that, um, I know it, what you're saying, Sven. Uh, one of the interesting things about exceptions is that they're not a they're not a variable. They're not a type like other types, and so they have very limited amounts of things you can do with them. And I, I'd like to think that over time uh, we would enhance that. But certainly right now you just have the error code and the error message, and there's no way to attach additional chunks of data. But even so, you'd have to attach it at that lower level. Um, mm. So I think yeah. you're right. It, it would be nice if it was stronger. Uh, it probably doesn't get completely around that issue. Um, and Sven also mentions, we also misuse error logging to store debug and trace information like input parameter values. So logger basically allows you to log parameter values. It puts it all into a, you know, a, a big chunk of data for your tracing and error logging. You're right there. I think that it is important to differentiate between execution tracing and error logging. They are two very different things, even if you end up using a similar infrastructure for them both. Here, I'll take this one. So Bill, since he agrees with me. <laughs> or maybe. I prefer to trap at the lowest level also, but I rarely check the production system. <laughs> well, one of these days, I'll need to write some code to email me when there's error getting recorded on production. Bill, that is a great point. One of the things I learned with the dev gym early on is that actually, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's our app versus, um, sorry, I'm trying to play with videos here. So my face shows up. <laughs> Still getting the hang of zoom. Um, Right. So one of the things I realized with the dev gym is we have a lot of people actively taking quizzes, classes, workouts, and I think they'll often have a URL that they've, or they've had a tab up in their browser for a while, and then they'll go and do something and it'll, it'll time out. And that ends up kicking an error into our log. And it's hard to tell sometimes whether those are real errors or ghost errors, but in any case, I've realized that I need to get, I need to not remember to go check the log. So I have a daily, an hourly report that dumps out the latest entries in my system log and sends an email to anybody who's an admin on, on the app. And I think that's a really useful thing to do in any of your production apps. You need to, you need to monitor it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Pete added the follow-up. I also wrote in an alerting system, you can't rely on anyone to check a log files or yeah. tables, which is very true. I, I mean, obviously, log files are for losers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I have, I have had a situation in the past where something was erroring for months and it was it was writing all the debug or it was all the information was there but of course nobody looked at it and it was it was some back end thing so no customers were complaining about uh -huh. it it's like oops this is broken <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay we have a comment from manfred and, and again by the way if any of you want to talk instead of having us read your thoughts and certainly if you need to clarify something just unmute don't hesitate the problem with tom's approach is what is the outermost layer as the complexity of an application grows, a package that was at the beginning in the outermost layer might sometimes be at the later, later time in the middle. And in fact, it could be both in the middle and the outer, depending on how it's called. It's a very good point. Um, I suppose if you're a, a smart DB proponent on the order of, of what Bryn Llewellyn, former PLSQL product manager used to say, and Tone Kupilars, um, you would say that we've got a very tightly defined API. We know where everything is. We know how everything is called. This is not a concern. And I think that's probably true in some sort of theoretical sense. I, I got to say that I have lived in the practical world of PL SQL for decades. And so the theoretical concerns are good ones to be aware of and to perhaps set as goals for how you design your code. But for me, wow, it's, I, you know, my stuff's called all over the place in a variety of ways and no built in guarantees there. Yeah. So yep. I think that kind of feeds into um, what I was saying is like, you should consider your package, the API and anyone that, Anyone could call it. Anyone could be the client of it. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to consider as if any Ute front end could call that package and whatever your business or defined way of handling exceptions outside of the database is, you need to consider it there um, for the most part. Good point. And here's, here's a comment from Dennis. And 
since you're on the screen, totally agree with Chris. We need to handle the expected exceptions as close to the exception as possible and sometimes re-raise, but not always. But when you do not accept, expect an exception, you need the full backtrace to understand what happened better. So it's not a good idea to hide the backtrace with a special error code. So a uh, good point, Dennis. Um, and Sven actually says, Judith, we do not need the backtrace if we store the call stack. And Judith says the backtrace was messed up by Oracle since 12.2. Yeah, there, there are some nuances in backtrace which might not be entirely what you'd expect. Um, Dennis, my feeling is that I can, I can achieve what you want to achieve pretty much by getting the backtrace as needed at higher levels. Um, and again, it's not one versus the other as far as I'm concerned. To me, the, the core issue, and, and feel free to, if you felt like you haven't answered me sufficiently on this one, let me know. What about the local data points? If I can't get the local data points, then I'm losing something that I don't want to lose. Um, and from Tim Scott, you can get the call stack at the lowest level. Is that not the backtrace that you want at the outer level? It seems like that's true. If I just execute, if, I, if at the lowest level I call the format call stack, that gives me the trace down at that point. You know, Tim, that seems really right. Um, and I'm gonna either put it into this code while we're talking or I'll do it soon after and we'll verify that. In fact, I'm gonna have Chris take over on the chat. We'll <laughs> okay. Make some changes to code. So yeah, let's- Yeah, saying, or oh, UTL call stack. Util call stack, or util call stack package, right. Yeah, exactly, util call stack. Okay. Uh, and, um, so just pulling back up through the comments, um, I think one we've overlooked a bit from Eric Wherever you handle log using a standard module like Logger, so every team doesn't have to write custom error logging framework, is the absolutely fantastic, great point, Eric. Um, I, I can't agree more. You know, come up with a agree a standard across your development team and use that. So, actually, I think this is a good one to put to the the audience. How many people use Logger, write their own, or just you know wing it and each time? handle exceptions as, as needed. Can we get some kind of like... Let's be more specific. Why don't you just type a message, yes, or, or whatever, yes. if you use well, logger yeah. utility. So write logger, yeah. If you use logger, okay. write, write logger. If you use your own custom version of logger, write custom. And if you do ad hoc, ad hoc for something else, <laughs> custom, custom, okay. Lots of customs, okay. Interesting. So the, for the people who use custom, is that because uh, limitations of logger, something you had before it came around. What are the reasons for, uh, or what, what did you feel you got for, from writing your own custom handling? So let's see, comments from Sven. Um, that is what I meant too. My sentence about backtrace sounds wrong when taken. Yep, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, no privileges to create contacts for uh, not being able to use Logger. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, I know they've uh, talked for a while about revamping Logger to not use system context values, but I don't think that's happened. Yep. yep I, you know, actually, I would love it if, every, if nobody said they use Logger because that would mean for most legacy applications, they've been around longer than Logger. They have, <laughs> of course, what I, what I hate to see is people saying they don't use either. Or, or they're using logger now, but in only a nine, ten percent of their code because most of it has nothing in it. <laughs> That's the worrying one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And we've got a note here from from Judith. The issue of handling an error means most of the time that you want to let the current unit to continue rather than stopping it immediately, or with or without logging and or and just propagating the error further. So if you want to achieve this, you should anyway handle errors locally. So great point, Judith. If you're um, if you want to continue processing, you certainly need to handle that exception and then keep going. So I guess it would be, you trap the exception, you know, trapping and handling are pretty similar. I don't, I don't know that handling necessarily implies that you're, you're gonna let it keep going. Um, here's the, so I ran my script again by adding the call stack along with the format error stack. And yes, in my logging, any logging utility I've ever written, I always store the call stack, the error stack, the backtrace. Should have done that here and it wouldn't have been a question, but here you go. Here's the full call stack and if any of you have, ever tried to look at call stacks in live SQL before, they're pretty intense because there's an enormous PL SQL API from Apex live SQL. And then you finally get to the part of the call stack that's your application way down here. Your call stacks usually wouldn't look quite this odd or at least your schema names might not be quite so odd. 
But so I think it's pretty clear that, and I'll make sure my final version has this in it, um, that at the lowest level, if you call the call stack function or a util call stack variant of it, um, and the error stack and the backtrace, you've got everything you need to go back and figure out how you got there and where the error occurred. Other comments? Um, I think uh, we've got uh, Pete saying logger Apex session capture is the USP for me. Uh, that's yeah, interesting. So getting all the details about what's going on in your Apex uh -huh. session. I think that's. I'm sorry. What what is USP? Uh, unique selling point. I assume. Unique <laughs> selling point. Cool. All right. Great. Okay. So other thoughts on exception handling and propagation. A different approach that from any of these that you'd think works even better. Does anybody who proposes to follow Tom's approach, which is that you only have the block, you only have the handler on the outermost level, never on inner calls to, to programs. Do you have an answer for me in terms of the application specific data in, in, the, in the block, or is it not that important in your experience? Any thoughts there? So I think the way I've used this in the past is they, they say typically within a package, um, Certainly, if you, I would only handle the um, expected errors inside locally, generally, um, and it's only the stuff that goes out of the package, which I, you know, the public-facing um, things, which I've tried to, where I would think more about what exceptions would actually go out. And then, mm -hmm. as I said, you, if you think you're going to need some kind of state, you can just use package variables. Again, you don't want to overdo that, but it is available to you in some yeah. yeah so setting package state meaning create a package variable for example l divisor there might be a package the, my error handling package and i add to the package in fact right here in this package if i had a an error logging package i could have a app info global variable and i could just dump stuff in there as i'm going up the stack whatever i want to do gather it in throw it in which is, i assume is similar to logger and all and so that that's not bad always the issue is don't forget to clear out your, your scratch pad variables like that, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's always a problem of making sure you don't end up with junk in it. And yep. of course, developers should do that. And if you've got a good API, it should take care of most of the situations, but you can be left with junk. And Sven says, I use Tom's approach, but switch to Steven's approach when absolutely necessary. I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, you know, to me, it's like, I need that local data, but if I'm in a, in a context in which there's no local data of, of value or of concern, why do it? For example, my inner procedure. It doesn't really make sense if it was really this simple. Or if there were no local variables, for example, just a number of invocations, there wouldn't really be any sense to putting an exception handler on there. So that I think is a is a good way to go. All right. Okay. We don't I don't see any other is not assigning a custom error code being sloppy. I mostly use minus 20,001 for everything and use a descriptive error message. So yeah, so in the, in the world of PLSQL, we have this eh, kind of bizarre situation where, let me just get to the code. When we want to raise our own errors with raise application error, we can only pick from minus 20,000 to minus 20,999, about 1,000 about error codes. Uh, Is that somebody speaking? Okay. <laughs> there was somebody speaking for a second. Um, so it's not assigning custom error codes being sloppy. So the question is, how do you deal with these minus 20,000 error codes? Some people just use one error number like minus 20,001, and they use that all the time. Um, they might have, or some other companies will use up all 1,000. They actually have gradations. This is the first 100 or 4X, the next 100 or for another category, much like we do at Oracle, and they run out. Um, my suggestion is that if you, and I think your idea, Eric, of having just one number and then putting the information in the application error message, I think that's a fine way to go. Um, you then have to, you know, you want to have structured as much as you can and unpack it in a consistent, pack it and unpack it in a consistent way. Um, I would just say don't use minus 20,001 because there are built-in packages from Oracle. <laughs> that use minus 20,000 and minus 20,001, maybe others, but those two for sure, which I think is a extremely bad practice. It's actually rude of us to use these error numbers that are for you. Um, so I would pick something that seems rather zany 
you know, like minus 20,177. Who's going to use that? But you might want to check and see first if anybody's using it. Uh, otherwise, I don't think it matters too much. The main thing is, is making sure any information you need later or any information the user needs to see is put into that message and handled properly in the user interface. And here's a comment some, from Sven, an alternative package instead of DBMS utility to get a more dense error reporting. And this is a script on live SQL. Let's take a look. From Sven. Um, so 12C error formatter, sin utility. OK. Now, Sven, is this using the underlying util call stack? Do you want to, do you want to unmute and tell us a little bit about it? OK. So it looks like what Sven has done here is right. Well, it says that. So util call stack is a new package added in 12C that essentially gives you more granular access to the information that was only available as a big formatted string with the DBMS utility functions. And so what Sven has done here, because we didn't do it for you, which wasn't very nice, is build a set of functions on top of the API to let you get the information much in the same way you did before. And so this code is going through and using util call stack calls to build out the text. Thank you, Sven, for doing this. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, one of the, the big added values of util call stack, uh, I generally still just use the same old functions I used to use. But the one really big advance, besides granular access to elements in the stacks and so on, is concatenate subprogram. And what this program allows you to do is see not only the line number and the package, you have a whole big package, and format backtrace, error backtrace, and error stack will take you to the line number in your package, but it won't tell you that you're inside this procedure. With util call stack, and especially concatenate subprogram, you can now get out of the stack that package x dot procedure y called procedure x. And then even if it's a nested subprogram and a nested and a nested and a nested subprogram within that same procedure, it'll give you the full nested dot qualified name. And that's really nice. The only thing I would say is, I don't know how many people really care about that. As long as I have the line number in my package, I'm going to find out what subprogram it's in. Um, so, and let's see, we've got a comment from Dennis. Maybe not exactly related to differences between Tom and Steven's approaches, but just a remark. I always try to use a function call builder when I write something into my log table. This always helps because you don't only see the line number, but also the values of the function's parameters, which led to the raised exception. It, if I use this approach with the combination of local exception handling, then you have the parameters of all the functions which were run and several lines in the log table for one exception don't seem as useless anymore. So what I take from what you're saying, Dennis, is that when you say a function call builder, you actually construct a string that has the, all the values of the parameters that were passed in, and that is then sent out to the log as well? Because that certainly is something that you really want a lot of times, right? Exactly. Um, I can tell you this. We know here at Oracle, the PL SQL team knows really, really well that you would like to be able to have an automatic tracing of your parameter values and that you shouldn't have to dig it out yourselves. And maybe we'll see it in the future. Um, one of the things that I've come to realize over the years, I've had many brilliant ideas of what they should do in the PL SQL team. And it turns out that my great idea and reality are often not entirely in sync. In other words, there are often lots of very deep, hard issues that I haven't had to resolve myself or think about. For example, in the context of automatically tracing parameter values, security is a big deal. And if we automatically trace your parameter values and those parameter values have sensitive data in them and somebody can see that data who shouldn't see it, that's really bad. We might get sued. We don't like to get sued. Putting aside the, the lawsuit part of things, um, the bottom line is that we, it's not as simple to say just turn on. It's not as simple to say just turn on um, tracing and trace all this data. There are a lot of other issues, not only performance, overhead of performance, which if you accept should be okay. But what do we do with, with data that's potentially sensitive? And how do you specify that if we were going to redact it? And what does that do to complicate the situation? So uh, it may be something we see eventually, but it's tricky. Mm -hmm. As Dennis said, and that's why some parameters should be masked. Right. So there's no question. It's doable, right? We could come up with a whole infrastructure in which you specify in a parameter by parameter definition. Do you want to mask or unmask and so on and so forth? All very doable. The PL SQL dev team is just like every other dev team in the world. Not enough people, really long list of enhancements, prioritizing like crazy. But Dennis's function call builder copes with that. So Dennis, if you haven't published that on Live SQL and you think it might be of, of 
interest to people, please do so. Yeah, that sounds useful. Sounds like you've got a lot of functionality in there. Yep. Okay, so any other comments around exception handling and management? If not, or even if, if you have other questions or comments around PL SQL, and because Chris is here, SQL as well, and a database design, we, we can move on to whatever you'd like to do. So comments, questions, thoughts, anything around Oracle technology or anything. <laughs> any, any questions? Anything. <laughs> Ask us anything. <laughs> Always happy to give you an opinion. OK. Nice, quiet group. Not nice, yeah. quiet. We, we want a loud group. Nice, loud group. They've been pretty loud so far. There's yeah. been a lot of, lot of conversations, a lot of, a lot of viewpoints. So. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.